In Encino, that's right. And so for us joining, uh, for you, excuse me, joining us uh, online, um, I'm going to repeat that. Uh, we will inaugurate the Biophilia Treehouse at the end of the month, Saturday, April 29th. So keep your eyes peeled. Um, also, if you miss, missed, excuse me, previous salons, they were conveniently recorded and they are on um, the UCLA DMA's YouTube channel. And now please join me in welcoming uh, Francesca Albrezzi. Um, Francesca, be very welcome here at DMA. Uh, it's a pleasure to be in a conversation with you today. Likewise. Um, so Francesca Albrezzi is a digital research consultant and a lecturer at the UCLA Office of Advanced Research Computing. She has worked with museums for over a decade, including the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History, the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, the Getty Research Institute, and the Institut National d'Histoire de l'Art in Paris. Um, she completed her doctoral degree uh, in the Department of World Arts and Culture Dance at UCLA, as well as a Digital Humanities Graduate Certificate through UCLA's Center for Digital Humanities. Her dissertation interrogates modes of publishing, display, and information capture in museums and archives that illustrate a break from traditional models and argues that digital modalities provide a distinctly different paradigm for epistemologies of art and culture. Specifically, she's interested in immersive experiences within art organizations as offered by technologies such as virtual reality, augmented reality, and 360 photo and video capture. We have a special guest today. There's a 360 camera uh, <laughs> recording right here. We have I to hope walk the walk. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we are very well equipped. Uh, Dr. Albrezi also has significant experience developing digital tools such as the Getty Scholars Workspace for conducting collaborative arts research and preservation. She was a hashtag? Yeah, hey, haystack, uh, haystack. Haystack. Scholar has worked and taught within the field of digital humanities, <laughs> art history, and cultural studies for eight years, and helped to produce an online digital art history textbook. Currently, she's a digital research consultant at the Institute for Digital Research and Education at UCLA. Um, well, thank you so much, Yogan. It's, it's, a, really, it's really wonderful to be here with you all today, so thank you for that. It, I'm, I'm really excited about our conversation today because I feel like AR can make the project come full circle. And so we're going to explore together the intersection of public art, augmented reality, and digital humanities in the context of the Biophilia Treehouse project. Um, maybe I can turn off, although it's a beautiful soundscape, I, may, I can leave it on maybe. Um, <laughs> If it, yeah. if it starts to bother anyone, let us know, but we'll, we'll leave it on for now just so you can sort of set a, set a mood. That's right. Uh, and as someone who worked on the Biophilia Treehouse project since the very beginning, as I just said, I'm very excited about the potential of AR environments, not only as a way to tell our story, but also as a tool to kind of continuously update uh, the living sculpture that is the Biophilia Treehouse by integrating, for example, bird abundance data, newly designed insignia made in community engaged workshops, and the archiving of outdoor uh, classes. And so what we're going to do today, um, well, we're going to kind of share, uh, in a way, preliminary results of our conversation. We started this conversation, I think, in October. Yes. So three, four, what, five months ago? Exactly. <laughs> and that's... Uh, what we are going to share today and I actually would like to start Francesca by maybe highlighting three of your recent projects sure um, to kind of create more context uh, for our conversation um, and it's important for me because your project seems to contend with the parse interface between the digital and the physical the ancient and the contemporary and also the arti artistic and educational as well um, so there's going to be, by the way, in terms of technology, there's going to be a little bit of a back and forth between what you see here and um, slides, presentation slides, because we want to explore those uh, AR environments together. We also want to listen to those beautiful soundscapes. But for now, 
I'm going to start the presentations here. And so, Francesca, we can maybe start with your um, Getty Scholars Workspace project called the Digital Melanie Project. And here we have, I believe, yeah, a slide. It's a static slide, but yeah. um, can you tell us a little bit more about this project? Sure. So um, Digital Melanie and my work at the Getty Research Institute happened a, a long time ago, back in 20. 2015, I think 2011 to 2015, um, but it was my introduction into digital art history. And so this project was the first digital cri critical facsimile edition that the Getty did, and it led to the creation of an open source, um, open access tool called the Getty Scholars Workspace. And the idea at the time was to think about how can we create tools for art historical research, um, dig digital tools for art historical research that um, really sort of put the humanistic inquiry aspect up front for the viewer. Um, so in this case, we worked with a, um, I think, 1680, uh, one manuscript that was a an inventory, an Italian inventory written in poemic verse, um, which was, a, it's a really beautiful document, a very unique document. <laughs> and we had transcriptions and translations done and invited scholars to work in a way where they were commenting and that commenting was then exposed through the interface. And so it would allow you to see sort of the interpretive nature or aspect of um, scholarship. And now that's not very new, right? We've come a long way. But at the time, it was signaling to the field of art history that we're going to have these kinds of tools that are going to be available to us, which are now incredibly prolific, um, to work in uh, ways digitally that we've been long work, you know, long doing, long been writing in the marginalia, but now we could do this in a digital way, sort of foreground um, that process. Wonderful. Um, and here, um, yesterday, by the way, I, I had some trouble making this work, and yeah. I think I, th I think it's an interesting case because it, it shows how fragile sometimes digital media can be. Yes. And in terms of preservation and maintaining infrastructure, not infrastructure, interfaces. Excuse me. Yeah. Um, you know, in the long term, it, we are so dependent on software updates, software and hardware performance. Um, but yesterday, I, I could at least take the screenshots. It was you know, working. Yeah. I, I mean, we've talked about this um, before in our conversations. And, I, and this has seen many iterations and is now archived in a sort of way that's no longer very interactive and, and gives you just a sort of sense of the project, but um, isn't quite the same as it was when it first came out. And that's, for me, what I've learned from mentors in the field and from working in this field for so long that digital things die too and that's okay they, they have their season they have their time and we do have to think about preservation and and come up with long-term strategies for sort of the care and feeding of these things but that at some point we have to think about what's a stable form of preservation what's minimal in terms of what libraries and archives can do to support these things because they can't support everything and forward migration becomes more and more difficult so what are the stable formats how can we think about jpegs and videos and in, in strategic ways um, so that's what you know this early work i think shows us in terms of the, the fragility of digital work is that we can think about documentation, but but al al also have to think about that kind of, um, what are the most stable formats for that? Mm -hmm. And in 2017, you started exploring 360 video I did. tools, right? And we have here this um, capture of a live performance that was in May, from what I remember. Oh, it's not showing now, but yeah, May 18. Yeah, 2017, so 2017. The Fowler here at UCLA. Yeah, so I started I started experimenting with 360 capture in 2015, and um, for me it was a seemed like a great tool to add greater context to how we documented performance and installation spaces. So I collaborated with some of my colleagues over um, in WACD. And this is a performance by um, Darian O'Reilly and Sarah Jacobs. And it happened during a Fowler at Loud performance. It was based on some of their thesis work. 
And what I thought was really intriguing about the use of this technology in connection with what they were doing on that day in that performance is that Jacobs, um, sort of during her introduction, shared with the audience, please move around and like find the best point of view because this, this performance is going to take up the whole space. And we want you to see the intricacies of small movements and, and things of that nature. And so that's something that we don't often see in terms of documentative performance, right? We don't often see how the audience is reacting or interacting with a work. And a 360 capture can sort of help us think a little bit more about reception studies. How, how, do, how is an audience responding to a work and how are they really receiving it or interacting with it? Um, so that's where, where I thought this kind of work um, could take us or this kind of technology could take us. And so here we're looking at the unwrapped version, right? Right, yes. Yeah. So this is the unwrapped a, version. Yeah. Usually it's stitched together. So it's, uh, as you can see from this camera here up front, right, you have two cameras on either side and then in post that gets stitched together so then you can interact as, as if it's a spherical sort of bubble um, of photographic ca capture. Is there something you wanted to point out in this um, performance here? Because I think we're halfway through. And it's yeah. so beautiful the way it captures the entirety of the space here. I actually like the unwrapped version yeah. a lot. It's, it's nice. I, I think what's really interesting is that you can see sort of the photographer moves around a lot. But even though people were invited to move about the space, not many felt comfortable doing so. And I think that's always what we see as artists, right? We, we envision, ah, this is what it will be. And then this sort of allows us to see in the archive, OK, it didn't quite work out in that fashion. So how do we then maybe workshop it and rethink it to really create that kind of engagement? Um, so I think it's, it can be a useful tool as well for artists in terms of uh, thinking about their work. Mm -hmm. Which brings us to um, this project uh, through positive eyes. Was it in 2019? Yes, just before, it, literally just before the shutdown happened. Okay. <laughs> yeah. We remember that time. <laughs> right. <laughs> Those moments. Um, and so here, maybe we can go online. Uh, sure. This is a static slide. Um, but you use Matterport, a different 3D capture technology. Right, so this actually, um, Matterport is a 3D capture technology that stitches together, can stitch together several different captures, either LiDAR or 360 photos to create sort of a, a simulated movement through a space. And I found that for me, as someone who co was coming out of muse a museum studies background as well, that the way that we teach exhibition work is one in which we often just look at a lot of um, exhibition catalogs, read a lot of exhibition catalogs, maybe see some images from a show, but don't necessarily get to always re see these exhibitions once they've been taken down um, that we read about. And so I thought it might give us an opportunity to annotate those spaces and actually have a more immersive experience with those spaces. Um, and also if an exhibition is traveling like this through Positive Eyes exhibition, compare and contrast what those installations look like and why curators make different decisions based on the space, based on the work um, in that space. So this was um, taken with a 360 camera similar to this one and then stitched together using Matterport. So it has that dollhouse effect at the beginning and then the annotations are um, based on all of the wall labels that are in the space and high resolution images of the works in the space. Maybe we can um, select one of the pieces here. And so this, that, that's the context you, you were, this kind of contextual background that you were talking about. This is what it looks like in Matterport. Right, exactly. Yeah, so you have these um, sort of annotation pips that you can add in. Um, you can show vo uh, video and photo uh, as well as text. And some of the, lim I've done a, I've spoken about this with, um, David Gear, actually, who was the curator uh, of this exhibition um, and is a professor at uh, World Arts and Culture slash Dance as well, and it has been heading up this sort of project for a very, very long time. And one of the things that we talked about in our conversation was that in certain cases, there's limitations to this tool. So 
For example, with longer wall labels, we actually had to put two pips. There's things like that that you have to consider. But for the most part, it really does capture what that exhibition was like. And we didn't have control over the lighting, um, so now using uh, Matterport cameras, we have better lighting <laughs> for this kind of capture. But um, I think it really does preserve what, in essence, that exhibition was. And in terms of technology in 2019, was Matterport just invented, or did it just... It had been out for a little, out. a little while, um, but it's only improved now with the increase of AI technologies. So the, oh, no AI. Yeah, really. <laughs> so the photogrammetry is getting smarter and smarter. <laughs> um, we'll talk a lot about AI, uh, as I think it's sort of becoming a yes, new we augmented reality in its own way. Um, wonderful. And so moving on in 2021, that was during COVID, I guess. Yes. And so here we have uh, Zonas de Contacto here. Um, let me play, it's this kind of a video game. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm gonna just move around in this environment a little bit. Um, sure, so I can say during maybe the-, the Yeah, there we go. Here, yeah. During, during the pandemic, obviously we were all sort of stuck indoors and um, it changed the way that we thought about how we were going to share what we would usu usually share in museum spaces or exhibition gal gallery spaces. Um, and so for me, it made natural sense to move into thinking about virtual installations. How do we create virtual galleries that are meaningful um, and show work and continue what curators love to do, which is have these kind of spatially made visual um, arguments. Um, and so, Zonas de Contacto was in collaboration with um, a digital art history journal um, special issue that we did with HART um, from Boca da Colombia. So it was a bilingual issue. And we wanted to create an exhibition that ran in conjunction with that and also celebrated the 20 year anniversary of Mary Louise Pratt's introduction of the notion of the contact zone. Um, so this sort of uh, negotiated area um, that is a, a, a cultural space where that kind of discussion can happen. And these, there's a couple of works within this space that I think really speak to what this pro project at the Biophilia Treehouse, um, some of the, the same kinds of themes that are being um, discussed and thought about critically. And so we could take a look at that. those sure. if we have the time. I know we're, um, maybe we could do one or two. Step back here, I remember you mentioned that piece here, right? Yeah, so this is Sophia Crespo's work, um, working with a, who's a founding member of um, Entangled Others group. And she's a really incredible artist that works with, uh, quite often with AI. And this particular piece, um, which is called Beneath the Neural Waves, is actually a sort of ongoing piece that has had many, many um, iterations, I should say. And so we featured a 3D, um, animated 3D model within the space. Um, but there's actually an AR component to that exact model that you could bring it into your own space at home. And it was an invitation to think about coral reefs and what's happening to coral reefs um, and how really simulation, evolution, um, and this relationship to organic life is, is a, a really sort of central component to her work in the sense that she wants to make sure that we're, we're maybe simulating nature as opposed to destroying it. Um, she's worried about the coral reefs and what's happening to them. And can we create sort of artificial um, uh, versions in order to help preserve the actual physical coral reefs. And I guess also create a sense of awe and wonder. Absolutely, right? at the same time. To foster greater environmental stewardship. Absolutely, absolutely. 
definitely. So it's it's taking the form of um, those gorgeous installations here. Yeah. Right. So we yeah. have this here. There's a great. I invite everyone to maybe review this. It's it's great work. And we have. There's 3D printouts. 3D I mean, printouts. The, yeah, uh, and some of these are run through um, AI and GAN processes, so they're sort of simulated environments. They're not actually real, <laughs> based on physical, real coral reefs. Um, yeah. Just an incredible project. Yeah. And so this is an example of the AR component where she brings sort of these um, Oh, and this is what's in, in the show, right? In yeah. The, um, so this is a version of what's in the show. Right here. Um, yeah. These augmented reality Oops. coral reefs that you can bring into your own space and sort of wonder at that, <laughs> that world. Great. Is there any other work that you wanted to highlight in this exhibition um, before we move on? There's one other AR work, um, Talalak, um, which is a it was a animated piece by. Where shall I go? Uh, Raul Ruiz. Urias. Um, so if you go behind this wall of beneath the neural waves, yeah, so you can sort of see it there across. And here's the here's the animation here to the left and to the right is the example. Um, so that's a collaboration between. Uh, Zach Matan of Electrify AR and an AR company, and Raul uh, Urias, who is a um, artist working out of Mexico City and uh, illustrator. And so they work together to sort of create this animated version of the Aztec god Tlaloc, who, uh, Tlaloc, who is um, a water deity. And I think really. This, the work speaks to sort of bringing ancient into the contemporary and rethinking, reimagining um, histories in new ways um, and bringing those things to, to us today using new technologies. This is so great. So we have here um, a zone of uh, contact or contact zone and another contact zone is the Biophilia Treehouse. Yes. And so from the very beginning, um, we've been very clear that birds were our clients. And our aim is to offer them a place to nest and thrive, befriend them, protect them, and have the public marvel at avian uh, life force. Right. That's one of the main tenets um, of the Biophilia Treehouse project. And also when built in sequence and installed in different locations, Biophilia Treehouses, they remediate to habitat fragmentation caused by LA's and bright old sprawl. Um, and in this network, uh, as some of you may know, each tree house is a stepping stone for birds. It's a complete ecosystem and it's also a public art living sculpture designed in collaboration with underserved communities who also suffer, as we know, uh, the most from, the, um, from environmental injustice, excuse me. And in other words, each tree house is a contact zone to avian wildlife and life force, native plants as well, and community storytelling. And this is really when augmented reality uh, can hold space for a conversation and also education. And so in our uh, conversation uh, since uh, the fall of 2022, um, there was this back and forth and we were kind of building from the ground up somehow and you selected um, a whole host of tools. Uh, I remember most of them are open source, um, and those tools are here to design a, an AR interface that identifies birds. But I know that this is just a low-hanging fruit, as you told me recently, but that's a beautiful <laughs> low-hanging fruit, I guess. Yeah, um, and so th there was, um, if I go back to the presentation here, sure. we had a nap um, first, if I can find my... Uh, here, uh, no, I don't have it here though. Uh, That's the okay. Berda, 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 Berda is um, and also um, Merlin Bird ID um, are both apps that I think are could be what I would say low hanging fruit in terms of when we're discussing. Okay, how do you bring AR into a space like the Biophilia Treehouse? Right. Um, well, I think at least 
making sure that your visitors know of these kinds of apps in order to enjoy the space. So Berta is really for uh, a database of, of um, different kinds of birds and maps to allow for people to have a community around bird watching and thinking about, okay, what kind of birds did I see? How can I share with others who are watching birds in this space? How can we create a community around our love of birds? Um, and then Merlin um, Bird uh, I, uh, ID is out of Cornell, I believe, Cornell Lab, and that actually uses um, or gives us the ability to to have a bird call <laughs> be recognized and then connected with an actual um, file so that you can here, oh, okay, this is this is that bird. Now I can read some information about it. And you're able to sort of interact in that way and get a better understanding by actually having your phone listen to the environment and then learn based on what's available to you. Also, I think image recognition as well, um, so that you can you know, take a picture and say, what kind of bird is this? Um, and it would help identify that for you. So that, I would say, is sort of low-hanging fruit. Um, in the sense that uh, applications like that are very, very useful and becoming more and more familiar to um, folks who are, are looking to engage in augmented reality experiences. I think what might be beyond that would be something like the work of Don uh, Dr. Jonathan Beavers of um, Central Florida. And oh, he's, that's the Mangrove app? Yeah, the Mangrove app. Um, and I think you have it up here. Oh, there it is, yeah. This is the README file. Yeah, so this the is GitHub the GitHub repository here. Uh, so this is the Mangrove app, and this is a set of analytical tools and a, a user interface that's been created to allow for people to do soundscape ecology. Um, and my understanding is that they're trying to build this out now into actually creating a database of sort of ecological soundscapes and thinking about how do we capture or simulate um, what it's like for an animal to hear and what, what does that animal hear as compared to what we might hear and how do we create a database of that for, so that other people can experience that. Um, and I think that that would be uh, a higher level, um, maybe a higher, higher hanging fruit, but a really incredible thing to be able to be in the Biophilia Treehouse space and think about not just what you're hearing, but what are the birds hearing? How are they hearing in this space? What are they experiencing in that space? Um, so, I mean, in doing some of the research that in, for our conversation, I also came across the work of um, Dr. Klaus Schmidt. And, you know, the, what I was learning was that birds actually see very differently than we do. Um, so they're what's known as tetrachromats, um, so meaning that they can see UV, blue, red, and green, and we're trichromats, so we only see uh, blue, green, and red. And so Dr. Klaus Schmidt um, has this incredible blog known as Photography of the Invisible World and actually has these great visualizations of what it's like to see through birds' eyes. What they, it sort of simulates what that they can see. It's an approximation because we actually can't see UV light, so we don't know what that looks like. But there's this incredible heightened color that, that um, birds have that we just don't see, um, particularly when it comes to gender. Um, a lot of the time we think that the gender um, of birds looks exactly the same eyes. Um, that would be a higher hanging fruit, but I think an incredible experience for us to sort of connect with them. For sure, and, and, and together with sound, so right, like yes. soundscapes, yeah. which brings us to, or we're going to go back to those beautiful soundscapes yeah. that we were playing at the very beginning of yes, our conversation. Yes. So let me just exit here and um, go back to. Entangled, I think it's here, no? Oh, digital ecologies, there you go. Yeah, digital ecologies. So here, I think everyone is curious. I was also wondering, okay, what are we listening to here? Um, yeah. Aaron, I remember the, you know, at the very beginning, what are we listening to already? And so here, I guess, by turning up the volume a little bit, 
Ready to play. So we are listening to we're ants. Actually, we're listening to ants, yeah. We're actually listening to, to insects. Um, and these are levels, um, well, this is, I should say this is a built soundscape um, that Lisa Schoenberg did. She's a PhD student at uh, RPI. And um, what's really incredible about these sort of hidden sounds that she's um, bringing into our our sort of zone of listening. Um, so it's through these spectrograms, what she calls spectrograms, um, and she's focusing on sounds that cannot be heard by humans, and looking at sort of ultrasonic sounds and bringing them, lowering their frequencies so that they're uh, in our range, so that we can hear them. Um, and also substrate grown vibrations, so which are very, otherwise very quiet sounds, things that we, we wouldn't um, normally be able to hear because they're just so quiet. Uh, and they're just beautiful. I think they're just absolutely beautiful. And really calming, actually. <laughs> very calming. Yeah. Um, um, so my, my interest in this work is, uh, and she, I got to see her speak at uh, the College Art Association annual conference in February where she showcased some of this work and also spoke a little bit about birds um, in that process and how birds interact with these soundscapes. Um, and I think if I'm remembering correctly, she discussed how in one case she was aware of deforestation actually affecting the ability of, or the, the owl population in a particular area, because what they discovered was, I believe, that the birds, um, the, the lack of trees were actually making them more apparent to their prey. Um, so that got me thinking about, well, how might we use data to simulate what a soundscape was 40 years ago and then also speculate what it could be 20 years in the future. Um, so to actually be able to, to recreate based on data, and it would be a simulation, but to think about the density of sound um, in a more populated form of a forest, for example, versus something that's less densely populated. Um, and how that changes the soundscape drastically. So th this is a beautiful entry point in soundscape ecology. Uh, how, how do you think we can... Because, um, you know, on the phone, it's, it's, a very, it's very visual. We are in the visual realm. How do you think we can incorporate more auditory or oral signals like these in, in, a, in, a, in an app? What, how would that... What, what would it like look like? What, what would be the... Uh, the ways in which we can also communicate on that level, right? S sort of visually. Well, I, I think, um, are there podcast listeners out there? Because I'm someone who listens quite quite a lot to books. I, I prefer uh, to listen. And so I think for many of us who use apps in that way, it's a quite natural fit to be able to uh, pick a soundscape, perhaps, within a certain location. And if we could think about time as an organizing factor, right, maybe, like I was saying before, we might look back in time or think about data in connection to a space where you could say, okay, well, what if, what if I'm looking at um, the population of birds 20 years ago in this space, how would that sound? Um, and an interface that would allow you to make those kinds of selections and then hear the comparisons. Based on actual data, or based, you mentioned simulations, right? Ba based on actual da data and then simulating mm -hmm. that effect. So maybe you can just let it play for a few, a few more moments here. Um, and so going back to one of your um, the things you. you you said today, uh, it, in a way, an AR interface can be seen as a very powerful magnifying glass. Um, but there's a, a question that remains, it seems to me. 
how close can we get to see, feel, and sense like a verb? You mentioned that they have a different perception, visual perception. Um, so how close can we get to see, feel, and sense like a bird? But are we sure that we are perceiving the world the way they are perceiving it? I think I think it's really one of the like the questions that is at the core of the conversation we've had in the past few months. Absolutely. I don't, I don't expect you to to give a final answer now, but if we can kind of <laughs> explore this together explore a, little a little bit. bit. Yeah, I I um, I know we have this idiom, you know, to walk in someone else's shoes, and I think that's sort of the intention here is to produce that empathy or sympathy um, with our non-human friends. And extended reality technologies, right, are all about tapping into the human sensorium and uh, thinking about the embodied experience and tapping into different sensory, le sensory levels. Um, so I think we definitely have opportunities with extended reality technologies to create that kind of um, powerful um, embodied experience and, and just to and create greater understanding through that, right? Just a, a greater sense of, oh, this is how you live. This is how you experience the world. And just from a personal example, um, I was online the other day and I came across a video that simulated what it was like to for someone to see with negative one vision, negative two vision, negative five vision, ne negative ten vision. Well, I'm someone who has very bad eyes. I have <laughs> negative eight in one and negative nine in the other, so I'm legal, technically legally blind without my glasses or contacts. Um, and it was wonderful for me to be able to share that with my partner and say, this is why I can't see things all the time when you tell me, hey, you spot that over there? And so he's able to have a better understanding of my limitations um, based on my embodied experience after watching something like that. And so while I don't think that we'll ever be able to um, fully understand what a bird's experience is like, nor necessarily do I think we should, and I'll talk about that more in a second, but I think it does give us an opportunity to marvel and to understand um, a, a little bit more of, oh, that's why they're sensitive to this, or that's why maybe we should be more considerate about why, um, because they're experiencing the world in a different way than I am. Um, so I, I, ultimately, I think it's, it's about the goal in the first place and how we approach that goal of being able to have that greater understanding um, one of my late mentors, Polly Roberts, studied with the Luba people uh, in the Luba kingdom in uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo, and she learned a lot of wisdom in working with those peoples um, that, was, that was sacred. And she chose not to share it because she understood, after working with them, that not all knowledge is for everyone, right? That there are, there's some things that we are meant to know and some experiences that are meant to be our own. And so how do we, I think that's part of forming respect with our non-human um, friends is uh, also respecting our limitations to understand their experience. Um, it's pretty profound what you just shared. Yeah. It resonates with, with me and I think the whole Candle Frost team in, in so many different ways in the context of the Love Your Treehouse project. Um, now let's imagine that we equip the treehouse to detect birds because what we shared with you all here is the kind of the first level of this uh, building, uh, AR building that we are putting together. So let's let's assume that we are equipping the uh, treehouse. I'm going to go back to the slice here um, with um, um, and maybe wait. I, I will just disable this. Turn it off here. Okay. So for my understand, if we want to detect birds, like <laughs> flying in and out, yeah. so we, we need one of these first, a Raspberry yes. Pi. Yes. <laughs> I guess everyone is kind of familiar with this very portable computer, computing for everybody. And we also have here um, the camera that yes. we'll have to uh, equip the uh, computer with. Um, and so we need this. We also need Twitcher Pi or Pi, Twitcher mm -hmm. Pi. Twitcher Pi. So Twitcher Pi is this interface here. It's open source, open hardware, 
uh, and it's designed to monitor bird activity. Yes. So we could imagine that the treehouse is equipped with sensors. Yep, exactly. And then we have a Raspberry Pi running the Twitcher Pi mm -hmm. software. Yes. And then what happens? Well, and so in that way, we could get a better sense of, like it says here, right, how many different types of birds are coming into the space, how, what areas they're frequenting, how long they're staying there. And that creates data that could then be shared with other biophilia treehouses, projects down the road, if there are multiple installations of this, and to compare and contrast. I think what I, I like about this is that we can get a very good understanding of um, how birds are using the space, um, what they're liking about the space, what's, what's working for them. I think what worries me about <laughs> a, a, an app like this is, are we just creating a surveillance sort of anthropological, you know, detached uh, observer uh, view again that we want to try to avoid and so I, what I find um, uh, really interesting is is if we think about AI in a different way um, and this is why I, I mentioned to you um, K. Alado McDowell's work mm -hmm. and in that particular eco-fiction memoir theory travel log it's very unique and it was co-written with chat gpt there <laughs> oh no chat gpt again <laughs> yeah they're exploring um and i'll, I'll quote um or, uh, this story focuses on quote machine a human machine experiment rooted in magic which produces a key to rewriting reality a manifesto describing how entangled human and non-human intelligence will remake our technologies identities and deepest beliefs um so i see this as a central goal of the the um sort of projects like the biophilia treehouse this eth ethos that we want to cultivate, right, to, to form interspecies connections. And so if we're using AI in that way, I think it, it is, an inc it could be incredibly beneficial. Um, and we are using technology now um, in part of the cooperative care movement. I don't know if people are familiar with that, but um, there's a, a, a number of, um, alternative and augmented communication devices, mostly buttons, now button interfaces, um, that are being used with our uh, human, or my or our animal companions, what we might previously have referred to as pets, but as a way to talk with them <laughs> um, and actually have meaningful engagements with them and give them agency about what they would like to do with their day, how they want to spend their time, what their needs are, and communicate that with us. And I think that that's a, a really profound um, and new way that we're, we're thinking about interacting with our, our non-human companions. So here is an example, right? Yes. This is, the this is Bunny the Dog. dog. TikTok. <laughs> that I became obsessed with over the pandemic. Oh, yes, question. I'm, I'm, by all means. It's not recorded, Adrian, though. Oh, right. yes, here, let's, let's get you a mic. Oh, thank you, Jürgen. Thank you. So, um, I am familiar with that dog there, uh, the videos of the dog, it's pretty fascinating. Yeah. It seems to me that he can showcase his emotions. Yes. Yeah. Um, but general linguistic understanding is that most animals don't have sophisticated language systems. Correct. So could it be, what, where is the explanation there? Are they using language? Do we know maybe if they are just mimicking what the human has taught them to do, right? For example, teaching them to press a certain button for a certain emotion. So they don't quite have agency in expressing that emotion. They just know if I press this button, I get this outcome. So. It seems to me there's a gray area there, but um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on, on that. I think there's absolutely gray area there. Um, that being said, I follow a number of these accounts, and I know um, there's being studies done in multiple different universities. Um, and 
they do have setups for these boards that are based on linguistic groupings to sort of help um, animals find um, or think about their words in, in particular ways. Um, that being said, I think one of the things that we've talked about is also, are we just sort of mapping our heuristics onto animals, <laughs> uh, training them to, to speak in our language or in the way that we can understand, rather than us trying to, to really follow their behavior and respond to that. Um, so I think it's an incredibly um, important point that we have to keep thinking about. Um, I, yeah, yeah you can jump in as well. I study birds. Um, there is a, a researcher in Japan, I forgot his name, it'll come to me, but he studies Japanese tits, um, which is a small songbird, um, and he specifically studies language in birds and makes the claim um, very successfully. I think his, his uh, experiments are really elegant, um, that there is a language um, that it can be classified as language because it has multiple components and forgot the exact details, but it's very interesting um, because you can get into their own grammatical structure. Um, and this is particularly in a social bird. Social birds are more likely to have something like that, but that might be of interest too. Absolutely, absolutely. And Lily. Hi, I, and um, you know, I have a similar edition. Um, so I took a class with um, Nicholas Hummingbird, who identifies as Kahuya, and he's native, and he also uh, knows the Chumash language. And the, the I can't remember the exact word that they have for bird, but the, the word for bird that they have is actually mimicking a sound that they make. So it's not just coming from you know an ethnocentric kind of idea of relating to birds, but actually being in conversation with the birds and um, in their grammatical structure. When they speak, not about birds, they're always speaking with them, right? So they're actually in conversation with the birds. And um, so we have to think beyond, I think, um, languages that are usually studied, right? And languages that are often um, pushed to the margins, right? A lot of indigenous folks aren't necessarily um, considered in studies, right? We, there's the weird, right? What is it, the Western educated? Um, I forget the other uh, letters, but you know, basically that, you know, we're usually looking at language from like a Western European perspective and inadvertently we're excluding a lot of other um, epistemologies, cosmovisions, et cetera, et cetera. Absolutely, and I think, I mean, just to sort of re-reference something that we talked about earlier in the um, um, idea of the Merlin I app, right, where you can take um, a natural song of a, of a bird or, um, and then trace back to how we have cat cataloged it and thought about it. At least that's coming from or u utilizing their own vocal, you know, expression as opposed to us trying to say, here, use this button to communicate to me what you want, um, and, and find maybe greater understandings of the difference in calls, right, so that you can understand what's happening because you now understand their language, you understand their calls and what they how they communicate instead. Absolutely. Did, did, did you want to add something, no, Rebecca? Oh, oh, you're holding the mic? <laughs> OK. But I, I like this kind of free-floating format now. We, we, okay. Yeah. Um, so oh, Ryan, oh, there's another have... reaction. Well, this is really interesting about the languages of animals. Do you see any parallels between that and what we're trying to do with, say, AI and chat AI, which has only been around for a few years now? Do we really understand what we're saying to this? Do we don't really understand what it's saying to us? Mm -hmm. We've had, what, 200,000 years of around animals and we really don't have a clue what, what they're saying. And so do you see any parallels with that or any room for using the chat AI with animal communication? Or, or is it just one kind of big linguistic mess that we're trying to work our way through? Yeah, if, I, if I'm understanding your question correctly, could we turn those, tool, those AI mm -hmm. tools that we're using on our own language processing to then create uh, like artificial intelligence versions of ourselves and what we need and require? Um, and think about turning that on animal languages or animal right. expression. And, and, yeah, and, and, yeah, and those two pursuits. Right. 
I, I think it's fascinating. I'm sure we may get there eventually. I don't know the ethic about the ethics around that. Um, and in some ways, it, you know, there are things that, you know, we can simulate calls that then create responses um, with our animal companions and our animal friends. So that, I think, certainly speaks to that kind of a connection. And if artificial intelligence could then do that, could we start communicating more regularly or frequently with animals in that way? It's, a, it's an interesting thought. And, and very quickly, we had this example here. So we're looking uh, at uh, the parrot kindergarten. Yes. <laughs> yes, this um, is uh, Jen, Kuna, and Ellie, her parrot. Her, her parrot companion. Her companion here. Um, and Ellie quite regularly um, picks her own songs of what she likes to listen to. She prefers pop over classical, um, just so you know. And uh, she actually just recently called Jen on the phone using the iPad um, to say, please come here. I, I would like I would like some attention. Um, <laughs> and so she uses uh, her her iPad as a form of communication, and it's it's um, quite incredible. And we have another example here. Um, yes, and, and t this is Tico right. and Frank, and and um, just just to say that we don't this necessarily need technology right now. <laughs> uh, to, to, colors to form friendships. <laughs> These are signs of stimulation and signs of happiness with the bird. So I'm letting him kind of delegate when he wants to do it. One of the ways Tico lets me know that it's time to start playing is he'll start to vocalize. <laughs> so he's, he's very much, you know, they're able to communicate without having to necessarily have technology mediate. Um, and I think that just comes I from a close bond and a, a sense of in some way. care, <laughs> right? Superstitious. But I just see a great performer in him. <laughs> I could watch Tico and Frank all day. When he's performing, Tico's flamboyant personality comes out and he arches his head like he's looking over a stage. It's bizarre in so many ways. I've never <laughs> seen anything like this. He's won in a gazillion. <laughs> he's been bonding a gazillion. for at least five to seven songs. And he's just yeah. as happy as can be once it's done. Um, so yeah. I think I think that's for me, you know it I it's great that we now have these alternative and augmentative communication forms, but we also have been, as Lily was referencing earlier, right, there are other ways that we can closely connect with our um, animal companions and, and friends. Um, and sometimes that's just through careful observation. Uh, so now, Francesca, because I'm mindful of everyone's time, yes, um, of maybe you can kind of speed up a little bit uh, and look at how, um, uh, you know, AR can add, not AI, AR, but although it's yeah. going to be maybe <laughs> AI also kind of powered yeah. uh, or informed. Um, how it can add layers to the Biofida Treehouse. I just wanted also to go through very quickly the slides here. So these are oh, yes. 3D modelings of the um, sensor um, um, installation yeah. on the Biofida Treehouse. Uh, it's, a, it's a prototype, right? Yes, just a mock-up, um, a quick mock-up to be able to sort of showcase how that might work. And, and the coverage here. And the kind of coverage that you'd be able to get um, with that sort of image recognition mm -hmm. um, that would be possible with um, that sort of technology. Which will enable us to, to get insights right on our phones like this, right? Yeah. I, I, I mean, this is very similar to the Merlin app, um, mm -hmm. but to be able to use augmented reality to view, you know, view birds and in perhaps even real time and have an AI be able to identify what bird they are and then access a, a database system that can tell you more about it, have them listen to, you know, have you listen to various kinds of calls that are possible um, that you might be hearing from them. Um, and even, you know, how, f how often they frequent the biophilia treehouse, if we can even get down to recognizing individual kinds of birds.
And so this is one layer somehow in this interface, right? Then we mm -hmm. have uh, that data overlay. And so here, I'm really excited about this aspect because there's already this data overlay in the Biofrida Treehouse. Uh, for the first version, we used pyrography to inscribe bird names, but also bird abundance charts right on the structure here. So if I can have my pointer, this is the bird abundance uh, chart for the California scrub jay, I believe. And this is one of our uh, team members, Grace Shu, uh, who was pyrographing uh, in uh, July, I suppose, and even a little bit before um, in June. So with AR, if I can go back to that slide, here, we, we, we would be able to create yet another overlay, right? So right. here we have uh, the, the treehouse, the 3D model of the treehouse, um, and I believe this is an early prototype of a bird abundance right. um, data kind of layer. Exactly, so that you'd be able to point your phone at the, the treehouse and then interact with different kinds of data that um, could be visualized directly onto the biophilia treehouse in some way, shape, or form, whether that's migration patterns or whether it's um, bird population. Um, you could be able to think about that across time and be able to visualize it in a way directly within the space um, and, and think about it in connection with the location. Mm -hmm. And so we also have here the potential to create virtual tours of the treehouse. And so we can offer this solution to, to people so they can visualize the treehouse in their immediate environment. Yeah, well. well, and this is also, I mean, this is an augmented reality sort of sketch fab, just being able to throw the Biophilia Treehouse uh, um, 3D model into sketch fab and bring it into your space. And so other communities could imagine what would it be like to have a, a Biophilia Treehouse in their space. Um, and this could take on a whole other level of, you know, thinking creatively with communities um, to bridge this sort of endeavor um, and think about different spaces and different ways that this could happen again and again. Um, I also, uh, I think there was a mock-up of, I've done some work with the botanical gardens here at UCLA in connection with um, uh, Anthony Banayaga as well as um, uh, Chen Ling Lu Zilini. And we've been uh, documenting tours that Anthony has been doing within the with the 360 camera within the bo botanical gardens and then mapping that on to a sort of map of the botanical gardens so you could see the different stations of where he's talking and bringing that into a virtual space so that people could have that immersive experience of being there in the garden listening to a curator of the garden that knows about the space knows about the wildlife and can speak to it um, and have that be a virtual um, experience so that you didn't necessarily have to visit um, and in terms of preservation of the space right human traffic can also be something that we might want to avoid with some of these spaces at certain times of day or year um, and so that could be an alternative to be able to say here visit this instead you can still have that experience but you don't have to be there wonderful um, and with that, thank you so much, Francesca. I, I would love to open it up to questions, but first, yeah, let's applause. <laughs> um, thank you all so much. Yes. We already started the dynamic Q&A, so anyone who wants to <laughs> ask more questions now, uh, feel free to, um, where's the mic? Oh, the mic is here. I can, yeah, okay. Hi, thank you. Um, yeah, I'm just curious for augmented reality tools, like, do you think, I guess, uh, anthropomorphically speaking like us yes it's lovely that the parrot's happy and things like that but you know what is the maybe downside of uh, of projecting a lot of human emotions onto these animals like I was watching a live stream of Jackie and Shadow the bald eagles this past uh, right. you know in the winter and everyone's like oh she must be freezing blah 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 and you know the moderators have to be on there like no she, that she has seven layers of down feathers she is fine, she is fine. <laughs> and so I'm just curious Please don't bring, bring like, them blankets <laughs> yeah how you see AR either like helping or hurting kind of um, that notion yeah I, I I think it's a great question I um, uh, am prone to think about um, 
my one of my mentors works, um, Johanna Drucker, the incredible Johanna Drucker, and she wrote an eco-fiction called Downdrift, and actually imagines um, when animals start to take on more and more human behavior, um, and sort of the unraveling <laughs> that comes with that. And I think we do have to, I think that's, that's the importance of actually educating people about what is normal, natural, um, typical of, uh, and when I say normal, natural, right, there's always variation, but I think what is typical of four different animals and how do we respect that? And how do we keep their environment as comfortable for them as possible and not uh, bring our sense of like, oh, I think they're cold, right, <laughs> to, to that. Um, and that can only come through having enough information. That's why I, I, we were sort of hinting at this earlier, and I don't know that I have the answer, but the difference between um, knowing and understanding, right, that we have enough uh, sense to respect what is um, comfortable for them, what is typical for them, and then how do we still be friends with them. Yeah. <laughs> you know, how can we still form a friendship or uh, is, is part of providing friendship to remove ourselves at times, right? To actually think about preserving their environment and taking ourselves out of the equation. Yeah. <laughs> Can we just build up, uh, build off a little bit of what you said about like the live streaming? And this is something that, that I'm kind of terrified with. What happens when you combine all this technology with social media? And <laughs> here's some laughing, like you know, the big scary thing that is social media and the way that can distort or maybe bring people in the, to a natural environment that they shouldn't be, or the, or perhaps promoting behaviors or interactions with animals we don't want. Because once it becomes part of social media, it becomes completely out of control to some extent. So can you talk a little bit about how the AR and this whole thing with little interactive social media perhaps? Well, I think at, from what I found, at least in terms of this cooperative care movement, social media has played a, a major, major role. And it's totally changing a generation's interaction with their animal companions in, in, in many cases. Um, I think we're thinking differently about Know, even things like grooming for dogs, right? Like, <laughs> that's not always a very pleasant process for them. And so how do we make that something that they're opting into? Um, or even in terms of affection, right? We're so um, prone, as particularly as little kids, something furry and fuzzy and sweet that we want to wrap our heads, uh, you know, our arms around it and cuddle it. Um, but that's actually not always what that animal is comfortable with and how do we then read their body language and their signs of communication that maybe aren't um, the same as pressing their buttons but if we can better educate ourselves through something like social media and have these kinds of conversation we can create a more knowledgeable set of um, uh, human uh, and animal companionships that are healthier for both. Um, so I, I, th I thus far have seen it as a positive thing, but I could imagine, I mean, I'm, again, I do have my blind spots. So it, there's also, I know, a lot of pushback in that community of people who are saying, oh, this is all fake. We, you know, they're just pushing buttons. It's not real. And that takes a, a toll on that community as well. So I think, like you said, there's, there's definitely um, complexities when it comes to social media and thinking about this kind of um, conversation. Uh, does anyone have other thoughts on social media in connection with <laughs> I mean, I certainly don't think they're going to be getting on Instagram anytime soon <laughs> without our help. <laughs> but who knows? Birdie, Birdie or Ellie is, uh, and is getting very adept with her iPad. <laughs> she may be taking over her account soon. <laughs> All the questions. So 
This is all so impressive, and but I'm curious as to like how you would advise Counterforce to create a set of ethics for how to go about implementing some of these ideas because it seems as though there's a spectrum between innovation, the wow factor of what you can do, yeah. versus your intention of what you want to or should do that's in line with you know the values that is a part of it. So. How would you advise Counterforce to come up with that set of ethics? That's a fantastic question. Um, I think, first and foremost, because I'm not someone who's a, a scientist that works with animals on a regular basis, I can only advise mostly from a technical standpoint. Um, I would make sure that those people who do know are in the room, right, and are, are advising. I would also invite, um, because I think it's really important to the project and it has been expressed in a number of ways, um, that indigenous populations, people who are connected to the, to the region and to the land, also be thought of in conjunction with this work um, and invited into weighing in. Um, because they've been stewards of the land in many ways, and that always hasn't been um, recognized or invited when we start to think about, oh, okay, then how do we, how do, we do this better? <laughs> well, they, they, there's a long history there. So um, bringing those understandings in and making sure that they're acknowledged and, and um, are participating, I think, would also be important. And then in terms of the technology side, I think really understanding the the connection between their biology and technology. So I certainly, like we have saw from these soundscapes, right, I certainly can't hear everything that a bird or, a bir or an insect hears. Um, so I don't know if, you know, installing these um, sensors would actually create an issue in terms of what they're hearing. Is there a constant buzz, right? I lived next to a building for years, and when I moved away from it, I didn't realize I was living behind a Fios um, building that offered internet, and there was a constant hum. And when I finally moved out of that space, I started sleeping so much better, right? Didn't realize, oh, of course, that constant hum is, is something that was affecting me deeply. We want to make sure that we're not doing that, you know, our technology that we're bringing into the space. That's why I think augmented reality on a mobile phone that comes in and out perhaps is better than having a sensor, right, that's permanently installed if it's going to affect them. So also talking with um, or having conversations, cross dialogues, or cross disciplines to think about, okay, how does that technology then affect, um, you know, non-human biology and making sure we're being respectful of that. So that's, those would be maybe areas to start with, um, to have deeper conversations and start to form around conversations around that and then ethics sort of in connection with those things. Thank you so much once again, Francesca. Oh, thank you all for having me. This is really a wonderful conversation. In this conversation, we shared, um, you know, preliminary results, right? We, we've been in a conversation for three, five, <laughs> if not more months. And so, um, yeah, looking forward to uh, exploring how AR can yet augment the Biofidia Treehouse project. Also with those very profound questions of ethics. How do we deploy such a technology with ethics or in an ethical way? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so this is also the fifth and final salon, uh, Counterforce Salon for this season. So thank you everyone for showing up today. Thank you everyone also. Oh, thanks. Yes. <laughs> thank you, Yogan. Thank you. Th thank you everyone watching us and thank uh, synchronously you, or team. asynchronously here. Um, and enjoy the rest of your day. Well, and be in touch. Let's be in touch.